The following presentation is brought to you by the Realm Network. It's right about time again to swerve again, confuse the general fans again. Add another swerve and then... Oh shit! It's Vince Russo! Vince McMahon's best kept secret. I am the anti-Christ of professional wrestling! David O'Keefe on the world title! I've got a wife, three kids at home, and I really don't need this shit. How can this show be so awful, Mr. McMahon? I didn't think it was. But Angle on a pole! Now you're the editor, right? Mankind did it! Chappy Chappy! Beep beep! Goldberg steered Russo out of the cage! I'm from New York. I'll get down right nasty. This is Vince Russo's The Brand. This is going to be a good one, man. And, and I'll tell you what, and I'm excited about this, and I love interviews like this because this is as real as it gets, and I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Listen, I was in the wrestling business, and I still consider myself in the wrestling business because I still make a living in the wrestling business, even though I'm doing it on my own. But I mean, you know, from 1991, you know, I, I officially started in the business. So we're looking at 25 years. Here's the one pet peeve I have about being in the wrestling business for 25 years. I've worked with Literally, probably, if I if I sat down and counted, I'm probably over a thousand talents during that time, especially working for three companies. And I've got to tell you, I can literally count on one hand and take away a couple of fingers of how many face-to-face -face encounters I've had with wrestlers that legitimately had heat with me. Very, very rarely did anybody ever say anything directly to me where they had a problem or they had an issue with me? I can't, I, I don't know, bro. I guess, you know, may, Goldberg comes to mind, but with Goldberg, it was never really about me. You know, it was the way he was booked. He didn't like certain things. And that's what it usually is. I don't think it's usually a personal thing with Vince. I think it comes down to business and the way you were booked. And, you know, listen, every, and I think my guests will agree with me. Every wrestler thinks they should be in the main event. And if they're not in the main event, usually they have to blame someone somebody. So who are you going to blame but the writer of the show? So that happens a lot. And, and I totally understand and I totally get it, but I'm never confronted face to face. Then, then, then let me tell you what happens. All of a sudden, I'm not working with this individual anymore. Then I go online and now I find out how much people hate me. Because when, when, when I'm not there and I'm not in front of them, they go to town, Vince Russo's this, Vince Russo's that, Vince Russo's all those things. And that's when I sit here and I say, wait a minute, bro. I, I worked with you for God knows how many years and you never said anything directly to my face. And I have an issue with that because I, I'm old school, bro. You got a problem with somebody man to man, face to face. So since I've had this podcasting forum for the last couple of years, I've openly said, bro, if you have a problem with me, come on my show and let's discuss it. There's no Vince Russo making money. There's no none of that BS. It's just man to man, face to face. Let's hash it out and let's set an example for other people in the wrestling business. I've said that till I'm blue in the face. But yet, those individuals will not come anywhere near my show. So that basically tells you all you need to know. When, when you tell somebody man to man, if you want to say something, say it to my face, and then they don't, I don't think you need to know anything more than that. But recently, a situation came up where there was an individual who had heat with me. And, and I want to say this first. When, when, I, when I started reading that he had heat with me, bro, nothing was said personally. Like he didn't say Vince Russo was a jackass and Vince Russo doesn't know how to write TV and Vince Russo killed WW. It was none of that. 
And, and, and I'll be honest with you, I wouldn't expect this person to go down that road. I'd like, I really wouldn't, but this person was released from his job and, and, you know, his feelings were that it, it, Vince Russo was responsible for it. You know, that was his feelings. So he had some comments to make about me, but not derogatory at all. You know, everything, everything was above board. I ran into this individual, like, I don't know, maybe a year ago. I'm bad with timelines. And I tried to, like, talk to him face to face. And let me tell you why, first and foremost. I like the guy. Like, I honestly, sincerely like the guy. So when I started reading, oh, geez, he thinks I'm responsible for him no longer being with the company. And then I was with him in the same place, the same time. I'm not the guy that I'm not going to avoid you. I tried to confront him. I tried to have a conversation with him. He wouldn't have it. And I'll be honest with you, that bothered me because I really liked the guy. If I didn't like him, I, I maybe I would have just said, you know what, bro, kiss my ass. I tried. You don't, you, you don't want to hear it. But I really liked the guy. Then all of a sudden, I'll be honest with you, out of the blue, like maybe two weeks ago, I got a letter from the same individual who basically said, listen, Vince, I don't. I, I don't want to have grudges. I want I want to bury hatches. You know, I don't want to I don't want to have baggage with anybody. And you know, he extended the olive branch of which I was freaking ecstatic. Listen, man, I come on here all the time and I say life is too short for freaking petty heat, especially when it comes to wrestling, especially when it comes to, oh, you know, Vince, you didn't, you didn't book me the right way, or me and another guy don't see eye to eye from a professional level. It's like, are you freaking kidding me, man? With, with everything going on in the world, I, I don't need any hate in my life. So number one, I was ecstatic to get the email. And number two, I could not get him on my show quick enough for him and I to have an open conversation and maybe pave the road for other people in the wrestling business that are at odds because I read so much crap and so much mudslinging every single day. It's freaking depressing and I, 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 I can't stand it. So after that long buildup, let me introduce to you somebody that I do have all the respect in the world for, and I'm glad he's a guest on the show, Mr. Sean Devari. Hello, Mr. Man. Devari, how are you doing today? Good, man. God, that was a hell of a buildup. Now that we should just wrap it up now. I don't know how we're going to go on top of that. All right, everybody. See Good you night, everybody. Week. Tip your waitress. We'll see you later. Now, Sean, did I say anything in that opening that – that needs to be corrected or tweaked, or did I say anything untrue in that opening? No, not 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 at all. It's um, it was kind of a, a realization I came to that I was one of the guys that never took this job seriously, and I don't know if it had to do with making money that it becomes serious and it becomes work and it becomes less of a passion, and then at somewhere in there the business and the passion got tangled up, and and you know I I was. I wasn't being a human being. I was just being business, 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 money, money, money. And that was that was the biggest part of, of I feel like our falling out was me leaving TNA put me in a financial bind, especially after like negotiating with Terry Taylor's new contract for almost six months. I finally get the deal that they didn't want to give me. I was lucky enough to talk them into giving me a deal that was that was very, very good. Hold on. Sean, me let, let, Sean, let me stop you right there. I just I want you to remember what you just said for further reference. You you just said I had to talk them into giving me a deal, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Just, just yeah, keep, keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. Sean, be, listen. Let, let's not. We're going to talk about all that. We're going to talk about all that. But let's not jump ahead of ourselves. Sure. Because I want to tell you what what I'm hearing from you, Sean, is something that that happened to Vince Russo. And I want to see if you and I are on the same page. Sean, I went into the wrestling business because I was a fan of the wrestling business. And Sean, I was never, bro, I was never one of these marks that, you know, I, I like the, the, these, some of these people on the, you know, on, on online and the internet wrestling community. I was never that guy. 
I was a fan of wrestling, like I was a fan of baseball, like I was a fan of many things. I enjoyed the entertainment aspect of it. I came to the point in my life that I needed a job. So I said, hey, you know what? Let me try this wrestling. I always, I always enjoyed wrestling. So I went into wrestling as a fan and very, very, very naive. Sean, it didn't take me long to figure out these were shark infested waters. And all of a sudden, bro, the higher and higher and higher I got up the food chain, the more and more and more I was surrounded by the fins on top of the water. So let me tell you what happens to Mark, wide-eyed, naive Vince Russo at that point. Because I want to see if we, if we experience similar, Sean. The first thing that happens is this. I become very paranoid. I, I, I think everybody wants to take me down. I think the knives are back. I have eyes in the back of my head. And all of a sudden, the thought is, who's out to screw me now? Who's out to screw me now? Who's out to screw me now? That was number one. Number two, I was never a political guy. I will never play a political game. That, that's why I'm on the outside looking in. I'm not going to kiss anybody's ass. I'm not going to tell the WWE how great the product is when it sucks because I want a job. That's not who I am. So I'm not going to play the political game. But what I had to do, Sean, was I almost had to put a shell around myself to protect me from my surroundings outside of me or else they would have chewed me up and spit me out. Every once in a while, bro, I had to say, you know what, go F yourself because they would have killed me if I didn't have this, this, this protection around me. Then all of a sudden, bro, I have this protection around me. I could feel my, myself, I could feel the business changing me. Then all of a sudden, the time comes for me when I look myself in the mirror and I'm like, bro, like, I don't like who you are anymore. Like, this is not you. You've become a product of your environment, Vince. This is not you. This is not why you got in the business. This business is freaking changing you. And I didn't like it, and I had to do something about it. And the only thing I could really do about it was get the freak out of the business. That was really the only thing. Now, Sean, is with what you're telling me, was it something similar with you, or were our stories completely different? No, it, it was very, very similar. Like I, got, I have a thing where it's like, I was the same as you. I was a fan. I love this job. And it was almost like you just said that you needed to get a job, so you got in the business. I was in the same position when – I was 16 years old and like my high school guidance counselor was like, do you want to get a job after high school or do you want to go to college? And it was the first time that thought entered my head of I have to get a job. And I was like, well, I'll, I guess I'll be a wrestler. And that was, and I started wrestling at 16 years old. That's what I did. But it was fun for me. And it was kind of like, it was, it was, I didn't want to get up at 9 a.m. and go to work. I liked what I was doing. I had fun doing my job. And then Every once in a while, I would get that shell around me, like you'd said, and I would always think of a quote that uh, I heard Scott Hall say before. He said, in this business, you can have friends or you can make money. And I would always think about that money thing and be like, fuck that. I want to have friends. Like, I want to I want to enjoy my colleagues. I want to be able to go in a locker room and laugh and not have that shell around. So I would try and break it down, but it would always sneak back up on you without even realizing it. And you'd have to take a step back and be like, fuck, this is stupid. I don't, I don't want to be that guy anymore. If you do your job well and to the best of your ability, the money will come. It doesn't matter what line of work. You could be a fucking bartender or a actor or whatever the fuck you're doing sure let, you, let, let me stop you right let me stop you right let me stop you right there and i don't want to lose your train of thought but bro you got to understand something i'm 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 like 30 years older than you so if i don't ask you something when it comes to my head i forget about it i do too it's a, it's a, you have adult hunts and alzheimer's i just have concussions <laughs> Now, Sean, I, 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 I want, I want to, I want to pick apart what you just said because you basically said the, if you're good, the money will come. Sean, I got to be honest with you, I don't know if that's true in the wrestling business, and I'll tell you why. Some of my best friends in the wrestling business right now are on the outside looking in. 
And Sean, I know that's because they were good guys, because they had good hearts, because they weren't, there wasn't a, an ounce of a-hole in them, and basically they got chewed up and spit out regardless of their talent. So like, I'm not sure in the wrestling business, if, 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 if it's like you said, if the money's going to come if you're talented. Are you 100% sure about that, bro? No, no, not, not. So there's, the money will come eventually, I said, I believe, in any facet, especially entertainment. The money will come eventually. Dr. Tom used to always tell me, you know, I, I used to call him every week at the office and, and tell him, like, you got a job for me? Nope. Okay, I'll call you next Friday. Got a job for me? Nope. Got to, and he'd always say, Sean, success is where preparation meets opportunity. So if that opportunity comes and you're prepared, you'll have success. But for some people, that opportunity never comes or when that opportunity comes, they're not prepared. Uh, a perfect example, though, I like right now is, is in New York, Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens. Those are two guys that have never been in the gym in their life. They've never tanned. When they broke into Montreal, they said, this Montreal is, is good for you guys, but it's as far as you can go. Then they came to the States and they said, the independence in the States is good for you guys as far as you go. Then they went to Ring of Honor. They said, you don't go any further. Then they went to New York. Now they're fucking headlining shows for Vince McMahon. And these are guys that every step of the way, they were told, this is as good as you can do, but you're not gonna get any further because of this, 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 and this. And they were just so fucking good that eventually they got there. Now, granted, they've been on the job 15 years and I was on the job five years before I went to New York, but I had a little bit more of that asshole in me that I was able to make the right plays that maybe necessarily they didn't. I was a little more cerebral about my career, but you know, shit like that, even like you say someone like Eddie Guerrero, Eddie Guerrero wasn't a dick and he was just was so fucking good that no matter how many times they, maybe they didn't try and shut him down, but you know, anytime he wasn't getting there, wasn't getting there, wasn't eventually got to the point where like, fuck, we can't deny this guy anymore. Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's, we're fucking literally taking money out of our pockets by doing so. But isn't that true? I hear what you're saying and I agree with that, but bro, isn't, isn't a guy like Eddie Guerrero, the exception to the rule? That's I mean, it. bro, That's how, how, how many guys, I, bro, I'm not going to say as good as Eddie because Eddie was tremendous, but how many guys were close and because they weren't a-holes, they got chewed up, spit out in the process, and all of a sudden they're on the outside looking in. Yeah, no, that happens more often than not. I think once they get in, it's a little bit easier. I, I see those nice guys just have a hard time getting their foot in the door. Yeah. Once you're in, it's it's sink or swim at that point. Like, it doesn't matter if you're not enough of a dick. Um, but you're right, getting your foot in the door. I mean, I, I I was pretty fucking aggressive as a kid. I had a huge chip on my shoulder like all the time and I would do anything that it took to to get there and uh, things didn't bother me. I was a hothead. I, would, I, would, I wouldn't take shit from anybody. I'm a completely different person now. I don't know if it's getting older or like I said, it's, it's making money or, or whatever, but I'm a much, much more peaceful human being now. Not even a wrestler, just a human, much more peaceful human now where it's like, I try not let that kind of shit bother me and I try and not be an asshole. Although some, some, you know, I've been told that being a good heel, you're a little bit of a dick regardless. That's why you're good at it. So maybe I'm just a little bit of a cocksucker. That's why uh, I'm, I'm able to hang around. I was thinking about it the other day. I've been on TV since like 2004 on somebody's network somewhere. And I always feel like I've been unemployed for a very long time. And they're like, <laughs> no, you have been on, you know, Lucha Underground and you've been on Ring of Honor and on their HD net show. And I was like, oh yeah, fuck. I forgot those are like TV. Yeah, bro. I, I got to be honest with you. When I was going, you know, I mean, doing, it's shit TV. No one watches it, but yeah. But when I was going through your research, bro, bro, I swear to God, I was blown away by your only 32. Because yeah, it feels like you've been around forever. And then I'm like, Mike, this guy was born in 1984 for crying out loud. I, 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 I was, I, I was, 20, I was 20, uh, 33, whatever I was before you were even born. Yeah. I, I had a little bit of, I think I, I was kind of talking to my therapist about, it. I think I have a little bit of like child star syndrome. Cause like when I, when I broke in, in 1999, just doing the Indies, but remember in 1999, the business was on fire. Yeah. So like, the indies I was doing were bigger than the Ring of Honor and TNA live events, even TVs that they're producing now. We would go to casinos in front of like, you know, three, 4,000 people doing an indie show. And like the, the fucking indie promoters used to book guys like D'Lo Brown and Al Snow that were like on Monday Night Raw that week. They were able to book them through uh, – 
to Dr. Tom, you know, like, yeah, I was, and not to mention guys, you know, that were still kind of red hot from the early nineties were all over the place. Like, um, I'm trying to remember some, I mean, I don't want to say red hot, but like, you know, King Kong Bundy and the Bushwhackers and Kurt Hennig, like they were still around the horn. Yeah. You know, yeah. so, and people recognize them. So we would do, you know, I remember like I was doing house shows for TNA and we would draw, you know, three, 400 people. I was like doing indie shows in front of like several thousand. Yeah. I did now, Smackdown house shows and B markets that were less than that. Now, now let, let's, let's back up because Sean, I think I've got to, Man, bro, I can't believe how many people like I have to. I I don't want to use the word educate because I I don't want it to come across as derogatory. That's not what I mean. I I but so, I, so a lot of times I have to stop, and I have to explain people exactly what my role was in wrestling. And let me tell you why, Sean. Sean, I was a firm believer in my career of. I believe, listen, I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm a Christian. I'm a believer in God. I believe that God gave us all different skill sets and he gave us all, you know, certain areas that we were good in. I was always a firm believer in Vince, stay in your lane, know what your strong suit is and do that because Sean, my, my, my theory he, he is to me, here's what makes a successful wrestling company. You have all these people with different skill sets. As long as everybody stays in their lane, you should have a successful company. Now what happens is lanes start crossing because people want more power. You know, all of a sudden the talent relation guy thinks he could become a booker and the, the, the agent thinks he be, can become a writer and yada, yada, yada. When the lanes start, start crossing because of power plays, that's where you have a problem. In my role, I always used to say, I am a writer and a producer. That's what I do. I, I, I don't lay out matches. I'm not an agent. I am not going to tell wrestlers what to do in the ring when I am not a wrestler. I am not talent relations. I don't know contracts. I'm not interested in any of that. I am the writer and the producer of the show. So I always stayed in that lane, even though, Sean, I saw the lines crossing. I saw, you know, I saw the, the talent relation guy say I could write a better show than Vince Russo. I, I saw it, but I just wanted to do what I did best. To this day, there are, I, I get blamed for finishes of matches, and, and I get blamed for wrestlers who lost their job. But by many, many, many wrestlers. And the fact of the matter is, I never got involved in contracts. I never knew what was going on with people's contracts. Literally, what I said is, give, give, give me the roster of who's on the show so I can write the show. Whether it was JR or Terry Taylor, I did not get involved in that because I was the writer of the show. Just tell me who the players are. That's all I needed to know. So with that being said, let's start at your contract expiring, the negotiations, because this is a part of it, Sean, I'm not privy to. I don't, I don't, I didn't know or I didn't care what was happening because I just want to write the show. So, so back up and let's start there. Just the TNA shit, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So the, uh, I came in on a handshake deal with Jeff and Terry, and we did the uh, the cruiser, not cruiser, what the fuck is it called? The World X Cup. And then they're like, if you you know do well in the World X Cup, maybe we could talk about a deal. So I guess I did good enough where we they said, here's a deal for one year. It was kind of shit money, but I was, I was okay with it. I was, you know, I shouldn't say shit money. I, you get fucking spoiled when you're in New York. So when you say things like shit money, it was, it was great. It fucking beats working at Walmart. So it was great money. But um, so I got that deal and they said, you know, do well in a year and then we can renegotiate. And then in that year on, on the TV, we did some 
decent stuff, pretty good stuff. But like on the live events, I was a fucking utility player, man. I could work match one with Consequences Creed. I could work Popcorn with Hernandez. And I was working like the main events with like Kurt and Steiner and those guys. And just wherever they needed to plug me. Okay, Booker needs the weekend off. Sean, you're in the main event. Oh, there's no heels to work with AJ. You're with AJ. You know, like I could go anywhere up and down the card. And that's why I was consistently booked. Now, now, Sean, let, let, let me stop you right there. Because again, I want to explain to you and everybody else the, the writer in my case i never had anything to do with the writing no, of house shows Taylor was my yeah. yeah no that, that you usually bro again i'm just trying to educate the audience a little bit usually the talent relations guy books the house show at the wwe jr was booking the house shows here at tna it was terry taylor and bro like we we never crossed paths like i i basically didn't know what they were booking on house shows i'm just assuming they're following tv so just go ahead so yeah so i was i i was a utility player i could move anywhere up and down the card and there was nobody else that really could do that you can't put aj and kurt angle in match one and on the same token you can't put consequences creed and sanjay in the main event it just i was the only guy that could kind of do that and the audience wasn't like what the fuck what's going on um and then so it was it was kind of funny they said you know come to tna it's a lighter schedule it's like fuck it wasn't a lighter schedule for me I, that year i was there i did every tv every pay-per-view all i mean I, if i wasn't like working them i was walking out with somebody uh and then almost every fucking house show every international tour so when that thing came up i was like terry you guys ran 125 events this year and i did like 110 of them let's put that on paper for this next deal so that that was the bottom line i said i want these guaranteed number of dates for x amount of money house shows less than tv and tv's less than pay-per-view uh and then we just went back and forth and back and forth and one day he just showed me his cell phone and he had a text message from dixie that said go ahead and do it and i was like "Fucking fantastic you know it had been about six months we were gonna go i really thought i was gonna leave because they were not budging for six months on the payoff and I, I just said, like, Sean, was there something that made them budge? Like, what, what kind of was it? Something you, what, what, what made them budge? If you didn't think they were going to, I think Terry was able to convince Dixie that although I wasn't like a big player on the show, I might have potential to be someday, maybe. Okay. Who knows? Okay. I don't know. I, 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 I firmly, firmly believe Terry was in my corner, and I believe Dixie didn't really get it or understand me or know why. She, uh, he thought I might be valuable because me and Terry are the same fucking guy. We were, we were utility players that could make any ham sandwich look like they knew what they were doing. And that was actually my relationship with Jeff too. Like me and Jeff even talked about that, that both of us had more faith in our craft than our bosses ever gave us credit for. And we fucking went on our own and said, I, I know I'm better than this. Yeah, and yeah. sometimes for less money, sometimes for opportunity mm -hmm. and sometimes it didn't pan out. But anyways, I think Terry was able to convince her at least for a couple of months that I was, I was, you know, worth the deal and, and she did it. And then, um, it was, you know, and, and Jeff had a big part of that too. Let, Jeff let, let, Jeff, well, let, let me interrupt you here again, bro. Cause everything that you're saying, I, it, it's going to make, I think it'll make a lot of sense later on. I really do like every, everything, bro. First of all, like this is the first time I'm hearing this while these contract negotiations are going on. Like I'm not involved in this. This is like all, this is like all Terry. I'm the guy, give me the roster. Tell me who I'm working with. I'm not yeah, in your yeah. lane. What's that? You said you're staying in your lane. Yeah, exactly. So, so, but now bro, everything you're saying, you know, it's kind of like I had to talk him into it. It took a long time. It was a while before Dixie, you know, understood would you say there was reluctance in giving you this new deal like did you ever feel oh finally bro these guys are a hundred percent on board and wholeheartedly giving me this deal or i had a fight scratch bite for everything in this deal uh there was a little bit of that but i, I wasn't I, I didn't have an agent so i really don't know what was going on uh, in the office I, I just talked to Terry. I never talked to Dixie. Uh, so, you know, and I firmly believe that Terry and Jeff were in my corner. And, um, and oh, sorry. So a big part of that was I negotiated my TV payoffs really good um, because Jeff at the time was running your guys' creative team, I believe. And mm -hmm. Jeff laid out this whole fucking thing for me. He's like, 
we're going to do this world elite gimmick, and then we're going to have the main event mafia turn babyface, and you're going to work with them. So it's like, so that's about six months of TV that I need you on. So like, I knew that money was in the bank. Let's just say for whatever reason, they didn't put me on any house shows. I wasn't on fucking pay-per-views, but usually TV and pay-per-view goes hand in hand. So when Jeff told me that, laid that kind of approximate six-month plan out for me, and, and we did it for about two months, and like for two months, I was getting fucking these insane paychecks from TNA that I wasn't used to. Cause you remember we would do like, and we would go there for like, we would do a loop. So we do like, I do a house show Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or Saturday, Sunday, go to Orlando on Monday. I would walk out with Kiyoshi on explosion. There was a payoff. Then uh, I would work impact. There was a payoff. And then the next day on Tuesday, I'd walk out with Eric Young on Explosion. There's a payoff. And then I worked Impact. There's a payoff. In two days, I would get four fucking payoffs, plus the house show loop before that, plus on Sunday, the pay-per-view. And then on Tuesday, that check came. I got like six payoffs for like literally one week's work. And when I say one week's work, I mean like three days. Now, let me stop you right there. The, I, I hope you're hearing yourself. Now, when you're saying I got six payoffs in three days, while you're – while you're in the process of working out this deal, and like you said, every time I'm on TV, it was a payday, blah, 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 blah. Now, all of a sudden, you get six payoffs in three days. Let's go back to Terry Taylor and Dixie Carter, and now they're seeing what the paychecks they're signing to Sean Devari are, especially Dixie Carter, because it's not Terry's money. Terry literally is one of the boys. Terry wants to make Sean Devari as much money as he can. Terry will always be one of the boys. But now Dixie Carter, she's answering to Panda, yada, yada, yada. But now when we're actually seeing the payoffs, do you think at this point all of a sudden there's a, oh, my God, what the hell are we paying a guy like Sean Devari this amount of money for? Well, here's the fucking part that I didn't get. It's it's like signing your fucking mortgage and be like, whoa, 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 this is my yeah. monthly payments. You should right, fucking exactly. do that when you sign the goddamn deal. You should. Yes, exactly. <laughs> but <laughs> but is Sorry. it possible I thought, now? I thought you were defending them for a no, second. No, 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 no. But is it possible now? Here, they, they, Dixie's getting the list. Wait a uh, 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 What the f? Sean Devari got paid how much? I mean, is, is it possible at that point now? See yeah, maybe anything's possible. Okay. But here's the other thing I was thinking is that I don't I don't know how your guys' creative meetings work, but could Dixie say like, hey, let's put the rocket on fucking – Never. Low? Never. Never got involved with it. Never. Or there's no – like, for example, if you're – like, I know in WWE anyways – a guy like Mark Henry, who's making a million dollars a year, that's why he gets those start-stop pushes all the time because yeah, they no. want to get an ROI. They want to get Not, a return on their investment. I, I'm glad you asked that question, bro. You got to understand. I didn't ask it. I asked it. Okay, uh, let's not get – hey, listen, bro. Let's not get funny, all right? I'm glad you asked that question, and I'll tell you why. Bro, Dixie was always so uh, – what's the word I'm looking for? Um, she would – bro, working hand-in-hand hand with Jeff Jarrett, bro – Jeff sometimes was guilty of making Dixie feel she was really stupid because Jeff knew the wrestling business so well and Dixie did not know it at all. So she <laughs> was very, very gun shy when it came to creative. So creatively, bro, she would never, ever do anything like that, ever. Bro, this is how Dixie got things across creatively, bro. I'll use Sean, Sean Hernandez as an example. She would put a talent when she wanted a talent to to get a push she would put that talent over to nauseam with little hints and little jabs here and there where me as a writer would finally say okay dixie i get it we'll push sean hernandez she would never come out and say it you know why because if it didn't work she never wanted to take the responsibility of, ah, oh, man, I told them to push Davari and it didn't work. So she would never, ever say that. She would just kind of look at the dollars and cents and say, why in God's name are we paying this guy this amount of money? That's, that's crazy to me. Just booking by budget is crazy to me. And then yes. the second thing to me is just that if you're investing that money into it, and, you know, we're not really winning and losing belts. I'm as good as you decide I am. Yes. I mean, you, there requires X, this much talent from the guy. If you can walk and talk and perform Shakespeare, you could get over. 
But so see, I, I would, Sean, this is the thing, bro. And I had this same conversation with Jay Lethal because Jay Lethal thought I was responsible for his release. And I, and, 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 and it, it shocks me when like a guy like Jay Lethal and to some extent you, bro, finances dictated TNA. Finances dictate TNA to this day. Bro, Jay Lethal could have got released because the electric bill was due. Finances always, always dictated TNA. I yeah, mean, that, that was when you told me that. That was new information to me. I've never worked in that type of environment before. Me neither, bro. bro I mean, not bro, even in wrestling. Sean, they cut my pay. TNA cut. I took a pay cut while I was working for TNA. Finances always dictated freaking everything. Okay, so I, I want to get back to your story because I want to put the pieces in place. So now, bro, you're getting these incredible paydays. Yeah, and, and then that went for like two months, and then Jeff had his little thing with Karen, and, and then he was out the door. Right. And then um, from my understanding, you got the running the booking committee or you were booking by yourself. Right. And then all of a sudden, I went I, – I don't know if you ever did the house shows or what the fuck no. happened, but – No house shows. I went from – that new contract that I had was fucking worthless because I wasn't working. You know, like I wasn't, I was doing every TNA event to maybe doing one set of T. I mean, we only did two TVs a month. I would do one set of TVs and I would only do like one day and I'd go home the next day. So I went from making, you know, whatever it was, I, I was working a lot less and my contract was kind of built around the fact that the previous year I worked like a hundred plus dates. Okay. So we were assuming I would do approximately the same and I wasn't making any money. But then again, that was, I was in a different place mentally. I was in a different place, my wife and my life and everything. And, and that money was so fucking important that I, I fucking lost focus of what yeah. I like. And so, understandable, bro, under, bro, that that's why with me, bro, it was it one of the hardest parts of my job booking wise was bro because TNA was structured differently than any company I ever worked for WWE WCW a lot of guys were like you Sean if they didn't work they didn't get paid some that, motherfuckers were working and they weren't getting paid. Right. Well, whatever. But that was difficult for me because I'm knowing if, if I don't write these guys in, they're not getting paid. And I, th that should not have come into the equation when writing television. When writing television, my goal should be write, write the TV you can, use who you need. I shouldn't wor be worried about guys not making money. But in some cases, I knew guys weren't getting paid unless they were working right and it was it's a shitty it's a it's a hard spot for you to be in it's a hard position for the office just to be in to, to it's just a weird structure i don't know it, i don't it know is, it is a weird structure. okay so now let, let's he, here's where can, can i now get into like the incident what incident oh the one at the ale house <laughs> yes. yeah all what? right I've been on this. I was just saying, I've done this job for 17 years. I was in TNA for two. Fucking, what about the other fucking 15 years? We're not going to talk about any of that shit. Well, you want to blame me for that, bro? No, fuck, that was great. I only blame okay. you the two years or the shits. All right, no, we got to talk about this two year incident because this is, I like this. Okay, here's the incident. <laughs> here's the incident. Sean, you know, and I don't remember at that time, but bro, you know, this was another cost cutting TNA. Sean, I you know. What's that? Oh, yeah. But no, but, now, yeah. but schedule wise, you knew, bro, bro, like we would do two days of freaking TV and shoot like 92 shows. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Or, and anything that 92 did, might be a little light, uh, yeah. bro. We would be at you forgetting about the Mar Bangladesh fucking exclusive TV content. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> but we, we, we would be universal for two days and shoot God knows how many shows because everything was saving money, saving money, saving money. That that finances dictated everything at TNA and still does to this day. That has not changed. So we're at the Yale House one night and it was, you know, bro, listen, after those shows, I'm talking about me now. Yeah, you're you. Yeah, I'm exhausted, bro. Um, people don't understand, Sean. When you had that kind of schedule, for me as a writer, and you got to do pre-tapes for like four or five shows in two days, 
Bro, I would start at 8 in the morning and be done at 8 at night. Bro, sometimes I did 40 pre-tapes a freaking day. So by the time you hit the alehouse at the end of the night, you are just spent. Like just, you, you, you know, I, you just want to eat and go to the freaking hotel because either, either you got to get up and fly home early the next day or it's another day of work and you got to start all over again. So by the time you hit the freaking alehouse, you're freaking exhausted. Okay, so we're at the airhouse. Now, I, I do not, I'm going to assume, this is very key now too, Sean. I'm going to assume Terry was there because I know the group like I always ate with. But I, I obviously, I don't remember this one particular time. Do you recall who was there? Yeah, I, I don't remember the Stooges that were across from you, but Terry was in your booth. Like it was Terry me, was in my booth. Stooges. Very the other stu well, I, I bet you it was probably Conway. I ate with Conway a lot. I ate with uh, with uh, um, uh, 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 Irish Pat, Pat Kenny a lot. And yeah, 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 Simon was there. Al Snow probably was there. Yeah, Al Snow wasn't there yet when I was there. Okay, wasn't there. Okay, so it was definitely so, Simon Diamond, and I don't remember the other guy. But you definitely know Terry was there. Terry was for sure there, and I, okay. I back my statement. I don't think Pat's a stooge, but the other okay. guy's probably a stooge. All right, here's the here's the god honest truth. Okay. Sean Devall, we're eating, and Sean walks up. Okay, now, bro, you got to understand. The last thing I want to discuss at this point is wrestling. I don't, sure. I, I don't, I don't want to talk about wrestling. So Sean walks up. Now, were you alone or were you with anybody? I was with Magnus and Kevin. Ma I, I thought Kevin was there. I thought Kevin was there. Kevin, we were Kevin's fucking youth bloodline. We were his yes. kind of youth, man. Yeah, we I know. Were. I know you and Kevin were boys. I know you and Kevin were boys. So Sean walks up. I was with the catalyst to all this shit. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you, yeah, you, you walk up with Kevin and Matt. So here's what I remember, Sean. You could fall in the blanks. Sean starts pitching this idea, to, probably to me. I'm the writer. He starts pitching me this idea. And what I remember about the idea is like it, I know the the storyline involved Kevin, something about you and Kevin being boys, something like that. God honest truth. Okay. I'm sitting there and like here's what's going through my mind. Sean like knows I what the wrestlers know, like, don't freaking bother. I, I hate to say the office, but I was the office. Don't bother the office, like, after hours. Like, just, like, the boys kind of know that and respect that. But, whatever, like, Sean went right over that, which is cool. But I'm sitting there, and this is what I'm saying to myself. Bro, like, I'm so hungry, and I'm so tired, and I just want to go home. Bro, I don't want to hear this creative right now. Now, you got to understand something. It wouldn't have mattered to me if it was Sean Devari or freaking Kurt Angle or Mick Foley. You, you could have put anybody in that slot. I don't want to talk wrestling anymore at that point. So, bro, Sean's – bro, what's the angle? Tell me the angle. <laughs> Refresh my memory. I know it concerned you and Kevin. Here's the – it's the fucking angle that everybody's doing now. It's the hottest thing in television. There you go. There you go. Fucking – I said, let's put some dash cams on, on the car, just like Jerry Seinfeld's doing on Comedians and Cars Getting Coffee, just like James Corden is doing with all his musical guests that he right. got that $5 billion Apple deal. My idea years ago, Vince, that you could have been taking all the credit for it, was put some dash cams on the windshield of a car, videotaping me and Kevin doing the loop. Okay. Just going on the house shows. Okay, great, good, a great idea. Bay and see what we got. Right, okay, now. You're telling me all this, right? I don't want to talk wrestling. What, what, I, I, I believe, are you shooed away by Terry Taylor? Because I don't, I don't think I was rude to you at any point during that conversation. No, you were, you were, you were fine. Uh, Terry didn't shoo me away, but I was already, a, I don't even know if you know this, but I was like on probation. Like they tried to fire me did, before. Did not know. I now, see, now, now, now you got to explain that. Like, what are you on probation for? Uh, so, uh, what was it? Oh, Hulk had this Australian tour that he was doing. Like, right. uh, it was like a Hulk Hogan, whatever. And I got booked on it. And then TNA, like, somehow had this Australian tour coming up months after that. Okay. And Terry said, I can't do it which was not in my new contract. My new contract was I could do all my own third parties as long as they don't interfere with the TNA date. 
okay. which they did. All right. So I was hot about it, but I said, fine, cool, I get it, whatever. A couple days later, TNA, not a couple days later, this, uh, yeah, it was a couple days later, TNA signs Lacey Von Eric, and who's doing the tour. And I go, Terry, fucking, how come Lacey can do the fucking tour and I can't? Because it was it was great money. It was like ten thousand dollars or something for like five days work. And uh, I was like, how come Lacey's doing the tour and I can't? And then uh, Terry's like, well, fucking, she had the booking before we signed her or brought her in, so she could do it. Then a couple days after that, you sit us all down in the fucking stands and say Hulk Hogan's coming to TNA. I go, you motherfuckers! Now I'm losing ten thousand dollars from a guy who you just hired. So, and then at that point, Terry just lost his shit with me. He goes, Sean, if you want me to fucking fire you and you go do whatever goddamn tour you want, go. And then, and then I. Hold on. I, I, I'm, I'm hitting you with the timeout here because now I'm, now I'm going to start coming down on you, bro. Because now, anyway, you're not now, now, hold on there, Mr. Davari. Now an apology is freaking coming. Hold on, Mr. Davari. <laughs> See, now, I, I know none of this before. Bro, if I knew this before, I might not have even brought you on the show. So, <laughs> so hold on, bro. So before this, you know, wrestlers in cars getting coffee pitch, yeah. you already have heat with the head of talent relations who says, bro, if you want me to fire you, I'll fire you. So I think... I'm not 100% sure, but Terry has kind of hinted after the fact that he might have been um, uh, the messenger for Bob Ryder, and it wasn't his point of view. I don't know if that's true or not, if he's just passing the heat, but it might have been Bob Ryder's was hot that I was trying to get on this Hulk Hogan tour so bad okay. that other TNA talent were doing, just I couldn't. Okay, but we maybe, must, maybe we, not. But we, well, hold on, uh, uh, bro. Can, can, let, let, Sean, let's review here. You're a very intelligent man. I'm as dumb as this rock right here. This is how I stupid I am. Why the fuck you have a rock in your office? You, you want to know the truth, bro? I'm a huge D John Denver mark. And in Aspen, Colorado, they have this uh, this this whole Just tell me you didn't pay for it. I stole it. I stole the no, rock from that God. place. Okay, let, bro, bro, listen, don't try to get me off track. <laughs> I want everybody watching. Oh, see, this is where Vince Russo gets all the heat from. Let's review what we've gone through. Let, everything I'm repeating has come out of Sean Davari's mouth. And I love you, Sean. But listen, I gotta, I, we got to review here now. Sean Davari has already said, I, I was negotiating a contract for, for six months that, you know, TNA really didn't want to give me. I had a fight, scratch, do everything I can. After six months, I get the contract. He already says that. The number two, he already says, I'm making money hand over fist, six appearances in three days just by going out with people. Number two. Number three now, all he's created this heat with the head of talent relations, Terry Taylor, over a Hulk Hogan tour. And Terry says to Sean Devari, bro, if you want me to fire you right here, right now, I will. Okay, all this has taken place before the alehouse and I have nothing to do with this, okay? Yeah, yeah. Am, I, am I right so far? No, sort of. You're right that you have nothing to do with it. But okay. when you said the negotiate the contract, that they eventually said, yeah, we want to execute this. Right, yes. The, the, what was the second thing? I already forgot. Uh... Oh, oh, the money, the money, the, the big money. Oh, I don't think they yeah, anticipated the, the, you the making six appearances, which you know, I don't write the fucking script. Right, you write I, I'm, with, I'm, with I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. But, but, yeah, uh, bro, my, I, but you and I know the Hulk Hogan tour. Why did you put that clause that I could do my own third parties? Don't say why. I, I didn't. I okay. didn't, bro. Uh, so no, bro. I'm, I, I, I'm with you. No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely with you. You're just playing but, devil's advocate. Yeah, all these things, entertaining talk show. Yeah, all these things take place, and you, and now we're at the alehouse, and you pitched this story to me, and all I'm saying is, Sean, get the f out of here, bro. I just want to eat my dinner. That that's literally that's all I'm thinking. That that's and, it. And that's, that's, when you said that's all that I'm thinking, that's because yeah. I couldn't think like you. Right. I'm not your age. I don't have kids. Are I've you calling me old? Are you calling years. me old? Did you just call me old? You did earlier when you started right, okay. 40 or 30. All right. Bro, you don't need to. I get it all. I mean, no, I get, I, it. I get it now. I okay. 
eat, breathe, live this business, right. all, especially right. when I was 20. Good for you, bro. But, but bro, that's no, what no, you no, I'm, I'm a little bit older now. It's, no, but it doesn't matter, bro. That's what you need to do to be successful. So I don't hold that against you. I'm not holding that against you. I'm, cool. All right, bro. Let, let's continue the story. Yeah, so uh, you come, you pitch the uh, wrestlers in cars getting coffee, which is a great idea, bro. I'm working for a local. <laughs> I'm working for a local promotion here in Colorado. I might just do that. So okay, so have now, you ever been on, on the road with the guys, or do you always work out? Oh local? yeah, no, I have a couple of times, bro. Bro, God, I, wasn't it insane? Isn't it the bro, living wild, wild west? Bro, I say this not all anymore. The time. Bro, now, I don't know what TNA is like, but New York's not like that anymore. Bro, I had one car ride, one, one with Arn Anderson that I never forgot in my life. Did he have the same cooler that he had since like 84? Like yes, first bro, you, you're trying to throw the story off track now. All right. So now, okay, so does Terry shoo you away from the table? I don't remember. I was pretty high and drunk, so but I just remember it wasn't It wasn't like I, – I, I remember getting the dodgy eyes from him. Time out, time out, time out, time out, time out. You, 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 just, you just added a new, a, a, a new little uh, a piece of this pie. Can I, can I defend oh, 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 oh. You were high and drunk. When I said maybe. It, it was after the show, so it's likely? Likely. Uh, but we can't, can, we can't confirm or deny that. Likely. Yeah, likely. likely. We'll take that out of your question. Okay, so. Real quick, can I say a couple things? Uh, it's all yours, baby. Go ahead. All right. Do I got to do this gimmick so I can talk? Yeah, you throw the time out. Bro, bro I, I picked up that horrible habit from Glenn Goberti. He always – you know Disco, bro? Yeah, yeah. I go to his club all the time. Bro, can you just say for the record, Disco killed WCW? Just say that and then you can make your point. Just say it. Email a little snippet. Yeah. All right, go ahead. All right, so go ahead. It's all you. Go. Okay, so uh, I forgot what we are talking about. I'm a little punchy. I you don't... were just throwing a timeout. You wanted to make some points here, bro. Oh, oh said... sorry. Yeah, yeah. So I'll say the way I fucking – when I don't know if you remember knew this or even remember it or even heard of it, but we were in Germany wrestling for TNA and uh, Booker used to go out with Charmel and there was like fucking zero security there, TNA production obviously, and Marks at the building they had glass beer bottles and they were fucking throwing glass beer bottles at fucking Booker and Steiner like by the fucking I was gonna say thousands but I don't think there's a thousand people there by the hundreds yeah. out, out outside bro outside no in the ring like in the main event oh okay 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 and and, and Booker had Charmel with him he said let's get the fuck out of here and then uh, they went to the they went to the back you know Steiner and everyone else is still in the ring Booker fucked off with his wife as he should have and uh, <laughs> that was the funny part Earl Hebner for some reason was the agent on the tour and uh, we get back there I'm I literally got out of the shower i have my jeans back on no shirt no shoes and earl hebner looks over at booker goes oh yeah yeah book it's way too dangerous out there devar you go <laughs> oh thanks so i have to go and wrestle in the main event i already wrestled earlier that night i go out there so i, I work in the main event didn't ask any questions was happy to do it you know i'm a company player a company guy i help out um anyways did that get a nice email from dixie and terry saying thank you no payoff didn't get a i didn't get two payoffs for that thing I didn't say a thing. I used to drive Kurt Angle everywhere, and the two loops I wasn't on, he got back-to-back -back DUIs mm. <laughs> two weeks in a row. Yeah. So I was immediately on the next loop, back on chauffeur duty. Right. Uh, so these are. I'm just saying. Okay, hey, I'm, 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 bro, I'm with you. I, I, bro, I'm with you. I agree with you. I'm with you on all that, bro. You're not gonna get me freaking. To, listen, Sean. Let me tell you this. Just to give you a little background, day one at TNA, when Jerry Jarrett was involved, we were booking the show, and they were telling me what the payoffs were to the boys. Yeah. And I remember sitting there, and I said to Jerry Jarrett, I'm like, Jerry, you can't pay those guys that little. You can't. Bro, Jerry Jarrett looked at me, laughed at me, and said, Vince, are you kidding me? They'll pay us to be on our TV. So, bro, you're never going to get me to defend TNA with what they paid guys. You're never going to get me to defend. They never paid the guy enough. So I'm with you. I'm, I'm agreeing with you on all that. It feels so, like we're arguing. I don't know. <laughs> no, 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 no. Bro, bro, bro. So what happens now after the, after, after, after Ale House? Oh, what happens? yeah. Uh, the, the feast or fired gimmick comes out and, um, they say I'm gonna get the losing briefcase for me and um, who's the kid that was with ODB? He was he did like a dog the bounty hunter like white. Oh, uh, uh, Cody Diener. Yeah, they said we're gonna 
Ah, fuck, how do we, oh, we were going to tie. We were both going to come down with the fired suitcase, and then we were going to have a match. The next week was Hogan's uh, impact. And then the one following, we were going to have a match, and then uh, I was going to get the losing thing and fuck off. Uh, and then I said, fuck it. Let's just wrap it up tonight. Don't fire Cody and or whatever. I thought I'd save his job, you know, take whatever my money and you had budgeted for me, or so I thought budgeted for me, and you could maybe keep give it to Cody or something. And fuck it. Let's just wrap it up now. There's no point in waiting two weeks or whatever. And then uh, and that was it. And then we did it. Terry, I think, checked with you, and I think you said that was fine. And then uh, we, we did uh, – Okay, bro, how does that whole story equate to years of heat with Vince Russo? Because I was responsible. One Wait, little part. Go you ahead. No, go it. tell me. I, tell me. What, what am I forgetting? After the alehouse, because that pay-per-view wasn't for a couple weeks later. Okay. After the alehouse, we were just passing each other down that like impact zone, like the little street in between the trailer and the venue or whatever the fuck it's called, the studio. Right. And you said, Sean, you know, Feast and Fire is coming up. And then you just walked off towards catering. You're probably not even around. You're probably just ribbing. I, 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 no doubt I was ribbing. Bro, you know what this reminds me of? This Nick, re- Nick, you're good that friends with. Planted a seed. I, I don't, I, I probably falsified it in my bro, head. Do you know, me. bro, you're good friends with, with Nick Aldis, right? Yeah. Bro, you know what Magnus's heat w- was with me? I found this out through an interview, too. And the same thing happened, bro, with me and him. I found this out. I DM'd him. I'm like, bro, you got to come on my show so we could discuss this. At one point, I said to Nick, ribbing, bro, I don't know what your problem is. You're never going to become the champion because you're a Brit anyway. And he took that seriously, bro. <laughs> Listen, he's he's someone like me too. Like you get traumatized by like right. like like you know, for example, like Dutch put him in those like British flag tights or whatever, and he goes, "Well, how the fuck is anyone else gonna know you're British?" And he goes, yeah. "How about they just hear me talk?" You know, like <laughs> all right, yeah. So, bro, I'm I'm not doubting that I said feast or fight is coming up, but I know I said that as a total freaking rib kidding, or I know I did, and I think I believed it at the time. And like I said, maybe planted the seed, and it, it honestly oh. got the big picture of things. It was right. no fucking big deal. Like, but bro, when you look back now, don't don't you kind of see like. Bro, I don't, I don't think Vince, the writer, had as much to do with this as I thought. I mean, I do now that we talk. Like before, like you know, it's, I kind of, I did it backwards. Like most people, their careers kind of go like up and up and up and up and up and up and up, and then they get to New York. I did just kind of like indies and nothing. I went to New York, and then it's been like TNA, Ring of Honor, Lucha Underground, Japan, Mexico. Like, so I'm, I'm like, I did the reverse Wizard of Oz gimmick. I went from color to black and white, and I'm, like nothing makes sense to me. But then, Sean, what really hurt me, bro, more than anything, I, I, I like you, and I always liked you. Bro, they, I try to talk to you, Lucha Underground. Bro, you wouldn't even look at me. How, how, how guilty could I possibly be if I'm approaching you and I want to talk about it? I was, I didn't know if I was going to fucking deck you or say something shitty. And like, I I didn't, I I don't, I was confused by my own feelings and emotions and thoughts and stuff. And honest to God, I was thinking I was going to lose that job if I fucking spazzed out. Cause we were in the, it was like a VIP room and there's like a tent, some kind of tent. Yes. Yes. There's a bunch of, it wasn't like office and locker room. It was a bunch of marks, you know, ticket buyers and shit. Yeah. So I was like, if some altercation, whatever, verbal, I blow up, I spaz, whatever happens. That makes sense. That so makes sense. Kind of, and Alicia was keeping me, uh, Ryan was keeping me calm. She was just yeah. like, just, just ignoring she the was, she was, She was talking to me and nice to me, Alicia. Like you. I mean, you did good shit. I mean, the best of shit she's, I mean, actually the best shit, the only shit she's done is that Ryan Shamrock shtick, and that was all you and Ed. Is I, my I, okay, so let me ask you this then. Okay, so what makes you write the email, which I was so happy to, I, I this is a sh- I like you, bro. So I get the email out of the blue, and I'm thrilled to death. Like, what, 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 what encourages that? Uh, it was just a lot of, you know, I get, a, I told you in that email, the only person that I, I've got along with everybody in the wrestling business, every single fucking person walk of life, the foreigners, the domestic guys, the office, everybody I get along with the fucking caterers like me, everybody, cameramen. I know their first names yeah. I know all the production, like all the fucking guys behind the scenes and nobody even knows work there. Like the sound techs. I know everybody and I get along with everybody except for uh you and test and test was even nice to me i just seen him jabron other people so bad it rubbed me oh scott hall too 
Scott Hall, actually Scott Hall is a big catalyst in it. Um, they rubbed me the wrong way. Tess, I never got a chance to talk to because he died, unfortunately. And then um, I met Scott, me, Kevin, and Sean Waltman, super tight, like as close. I mean, they I take as the biggest compliment. They always be like, you, you know, you'd be in the back of the van, like if this was like the mid '90s, like you'd be in our car. And um, and then I just every time I met Scott, I was like, how the fuck does this asshole get along with these guys? Like, what the fuck do they see in him or whatever? This is every time I met Scott, just worthless piece of shit human being. I met him maybe two weeks. I shouldn't have met him. Saw him again. It feels like I met him two weeks before I sent you that email. And it was as if I was meeting somebody for the first time. He was sober. He hadn't touched a gimmick or alcohol in like two years. And he was like just an amazing human being with tons of knowledge about wrestling but fucking knowledge about life and being a good person and shit like that and like i said it was like meeting somebody for the first time and i was going fuck now i know why him and sean and kevin got along so well because that fucking douchebag that i met these last few years they don't even know that guy he's not the guy that they traveled with for years and years he's some other monster but now he's back to the guy that everybody apparently knew and loved and so there's another guy off my list. We get along, we text every day. You know, he checks up on me, how you doing? He watches my little brother on, on New York's cruiserweight gimmick and he's telling me, oh, your brother did great and this and that. And, you know, and me and his son, Cody, get along really well. And um, yeah, and that, that was kind of just like, fuck. So going down the list, I was like, you were the only guy that I knew that I didn't get along with. And there's no fucking reason for it. The main reason I thought in my head was maybe like, I thought you cost me my job, but really it was just, even if you did or didn't, it was just a different, point of view we had a different perspective on 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 certain things on sh tons of shit we agree on tons of shit we disagree but there's no reason we have to dislike each other over it right. i said I, I had that fucking shell we talked about earlier yeah. again yeah. i said get that motherfucker off you and send him an email say you know think i'll tell you what for fucking that first year and even up until you know whenever i got released like if you were writing the shows you put a lot of money in my pocket more than like a, a lot of other guys were getting so i why the how the fuck I'd be mad at you for that? You paid my well, mortgage. You got me a couple cars. It's like, yeah. Well, I'm 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 glad we're good. Cause like I said, bro, I always like that. That what, bro? It really hurts me. Like when I really like somebody. Like, bro, when it's somebody, I'm like, you know, bro. Deep down inside, the guy's just an a hole. But like, you know, when when I hear you know guys like you, and then you know, like I said, when Nick was on the show, and then you know when I hear Jay Lethal, it freaking breaks my heart because I I like these guys and like i said bro everything with tna was finances every it dictated everything and still does to this day and i told jay the same thing bro the reason they probably stopped using you is because th this bill was coming up and they didn't have the money to pay it that's really what it always came down to but yeah. anyway sean i want to go on to a next topic this is another tough no, topic we leave tna for fuck's sake yeah, this is a tough topic, bro. This is a tough topic, okay? But I got to ask you about this topic. When I'm going through your resume today, like I said, bro, I'm blown away by, oh, my God, freaking Davari is only 32 years old. You got all the talent in the world. Why? What's that? He said it's worthless now. Not yeah, but, but hold, well, let's talk about that for a second. I'm saying this guy's got all the talent in the world regardless if there's heat here there that that's be a, 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 there's always heat and baggage in wrestling i don't care who you are so he's 32 years old probably hasn't even hit the prime of his career yet why isn't this guy working full i, I am i, I am. That, that was funny i said earlier i feel like i'm unemployed because i'm used to doing like 200 right. plus dates a year right. but I, I am like i don't have a day job I, no, I but, but, but no but bro hold on you didn't let me finish bro <laughs> My the, the rest of it is why isn't this guy working full time for a company for new york i mean that's the only place you can work full time well I, but you could work at lucha i do work for lucha oh you're still working for lucha i just asked for my release the other day so i, I haven't gotten it yet they might not give it to me but but have you been on their TV recently, Lucha? Well, I just got cut from the fucking last. Uh, the, I was on the season finale, and the, that was actually, I think, the one you were at. And they cut it because I wrestled Paul London, and he did some stupid gimmick where he had a hood, but he took his hood off. It was retarded. And uh, 
and anyways, they didn't like it, and they cut the match out. So I, I, And that was the last time you worked there? That was the season finale of season two. Jordan, here's my point. This is what I'm trying to get to because I'm trying to figure this out because you are freaking talented. You're unique. Bro, you're a great talker, and there are not many great talkers these days. I want to ask you this question, bro, and this is a tough question, okay? Bro, back in the day when America had conflict with other countries, we used that to our advantage. We used it, bro. I mean, when when Slaughter went to the other side, it was huge heat. The Iron Sheik, we used that to – wrestling used that to our advantage. And yeah. it, it drew freaking huge. Well, bro, fast forward 30 years later, the climate, the cl- cl- climate has changed. Everybody in 2016, there's this politically correctiveness. Everything's got to be done the right way. Bro, if you look at somebody wrong, you're a racist, you're this, you're that, you're all these. Bro, I got called a, race, a racist the other day because as a joke, I said that Finn Balor uh, just got a new job as a spokesman for Lucky Charms. They yeah. called me. They called me a racist, bro. I got called a racist because of that. But my point is, your nationality, your background, is that hurting you now compared to thirty years ago? You would have been the t- heel on top because everybody's so politically correct do you think that's hurting your career no and are you what kind of journalist are you do your research you, you realize i got my job after 9 11 <laughs> like i was i'm fine yeah, but bro I, I but bro i think it's different with isis now and all that crap I, I, about like after 2000 like yeah like yeah, yeah my, yeah, my, yeah, my yeah. hottest run was like 2004 to 2008 yes yes you're, you're talking about after 2000. Yeah, because I think, bro, I think we're becoming yeah. more and more and more politically correct, and everybody's a racist, and everything happening with the cops and all that. It, yeah. it, to me, it's getting worse and worse. And I'm just thinking to myself, is this a hindrance to why they might not want to use you on a main stage? No, I don't. I don't. I don't think so. I don't know, but I want to. I was telling my brother this the other day. Because when he went to, I don't know if you know what's going on right now. But w, I don't even know if you even watch this wrestling anymore. But like, WWE is doing this cruiserweight thing. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They, they booked him for it, and I was just like, "Don't be a fucking Arab. Don't wear your turban. Just be a fucking good wrestler, so they can fucking come up with anything for you. If you walk out with that turban, I don't know about Hunter how he operates really, but I know if you walk out with a turban, that's all Vince is gonna see, and that's all you're ever gonna be. That's a good yeah. point, man. And I said, I said you could be a fucking Mexican, you could be an Arab, you could be Italian. My, my old partner, Muhammad Hassan, was a fucking Italian. He wasn't an Arab, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, anyways, um, I think the time is right to have a baby face Middle Easterner because we've never had one. That I was thinking work. the same thing, bro, right before we're, this interview. Go ahead. Because and, and it's a little bit different because me and you are for major markets. I, I really don't know uh, how the rest of the country really operates or something. But in major markets, fucking foreigners like me, we're, we're not that abnormal anymore like you just see him fucking everywhere you go to new york la orange county to, uh, houston chicago there's fucking arabs everywhere like white people are kind of the minority these days and there's fucking plenty of reasons to hate them other than terrorists they're the most pompous fucking arrogant cocksuckers i've ever met in my life like when i go places i don't tell them i'm persian they're like oh what are you some douchebag that wears fucking 10 sprays of cologne and a gold chain and drives a white mercedes i'm like like to me that's that's fucking heat like it could be but i don't know if some fucking hillbilly in mobile alabama even knows that exists or all they know is isis yeah i don't, I don't know the statistics of, of, of who our viewers are anymore but yeah bro I was, I was thinking the same exact thing why in 2016 couldn't you work in a baby face role It'd be a great freaking story to tell dude i i, I know sammy Zayn is working as a baby face because he's um uh Fuck, I forget where he's from. He's from Lebanon or somewhere. And um, anyways, New York tours there. 
So they said, we're not turning this motherfucker heel. He's our PR guy. He's our baby face in all the main events when they go over there. So maybe, you know, Obama just lifts sanctions against Iran for Americans do business there. I bet you if New York starts doing live events in Iran, I'll probably be called up in a week or probably I'll get fucking told to fuck off. I'll get my little brother instead. He is much more, uh, much more, less miles on him, you know. But Oh, yeah, especially after you appeared on this show, they'll never use you. But anyway, <laughs> Sean. Right. Not that much worse than that. Sure, I gotta ask you another thing. This 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 blows my mind. I, I saw this and I loved it, but I gotta ask you a question about this. Bro, talk to me about the subway gimmick. Oh the god. Dude, shock. I just talked about this in another interview. Shit like this happens to me all the fucking time. Where there's a circumstance or a situation going around and I don't want anything to do with it. And I just kind of look around and I go, fuck, I'm the only guy that can handle this. And it happens to me all the time. I was walking down the street. A guy's fucking smacking his girlfriend around. I'm looking for cops. I'm looking for anybody. God damn it. I have to fucking get in the middle of it. Fucking middle of the night. My next door neighbor knocks on my door. I answer. She's crying. You got to help me. You got to help me. Fucking she's getting slung around by her husband. I have to go take care of that. I'm sitting on the subway going to the fucking airport. I got my headphones in. I'm, you know, I, I'm fucking used to Looney Tunes everywhere in new york wherever you see bums they're walking around saying crazy shit being drunk high whatever fucked up it doesn't bother me i'm pretty callous to the world i have very little empathy or sympathy anymore but for i could see everybody was really uncomfortable this guy's ranting and raving motherfucker this and jews and kikes that and fucking eventually this like tiny old chinese guy or asian guy or whatever he's just like um you know hey sit down like you're making this fucking horribly uncomfortable for everyone and uh he goes, oh, I'm going to fucking kill you. I'm going to fucking kill you, you old gook bastard, and whatever he says. And then uh, I'm just going like, please, somebody, just get in the middle of this. I'm watching this from like literally 10 feet away going, fuck, fuck, fuck. So then about the third time he goes, I'm going to kill you. He has a backpack on. And he swings his backpack off, and he unzips it. And I was right there. I just went, oh, shit. And I just jumped up, and I choked the guy out. And um, I didn't know. He might have been pulling out a fucking cell phone. I don't know. And I just At that point, I was like, ah, shit, I got to do something. So I choked the guy out, and then I really didn't know what to do from there. I was just kind of like, all right, he's unconscious. And then just <laughs> coincidentally, the train hit the next stop, and the doors open, and I just shit can him off the train. And then <laughs> the doors close. I get up back on there. I'm going to the airport to fly home. And then I'm just going, please, God, get me to the airport before the cops come. And yeah. not so much. I mean, I'm a little worried about the legal trouble, but I just don't want to miss my flight. I just wanted to go home so bad. So I get on the plane. I go home. I go, yes, I fucking got out of it. Everything's cool. Next day, I get a phone call from TMZ, like, oh, we got the subway footage of you, you know, someone emailed, and I was like, ah, shit, and uh, whatever. But it was one of those things that I was like, I saw it, and then WWE called me up, and like, we want to do an article on WWE.com about this, and I was just going like, this is the type of shit where it's like, I don't think anyone looked at me as a fucking heel Arab because yeah, of but you, you, but see, Sean, you, but here's the thing, bro. This is what amazes me. When you are smarter than we give him credit for, but wait, when you're sitting there, hold on a minute. When you're sitting there watching this, isn't that going through your mind, bro? Aren't you thinking, Oh my God, if, if I do the right thing and I need to do the right thing, somebody may see this and think I'm the freaking bad guy. And literally I could get shot in the back. Like, are you not thinking that? No, and unfortunately, I never do. I, I don't. Wow, I just, bro, that amazes me, especially you're talking stupid. about the neighbor next door needs help. The guy, how is that not, and like, how are you, especially what's going on with police brutality and all, like, how are you not thinking that, bro? I'm just, I'm dumb. I'm dumb. I'm young. I'm short. I got a chip on my shoulder. I don't know. I don't know why I do the things I do. I'm, I told, I have a lot of child star syndrome in my head and I'm really, really fucked up. I said earlier, I see a therapist. Like I, yeah, bro, what, what do you see a therapist about? You kind of went over that. Like what, what, like, why did you go to a therapist? I, you know, it was just, I'm, I was a really, really young kid at the end of the fucking wild, wild west era of wrestling. And that's influenced me way too much where I'm so fucking desensitized to normal shit. It doesn't bother me. And like, it's, it's really fucked up. I, I was actually, you know, I had a really, really good upbringing, great parents and stuff. I'm like, why am I so fucking different than 
normal people. Like, why do I chase excitement and fucking parties and drugs and alcohol and girls to excess? Like, why do I sleep two hours? Cause I want to stay at a strip club till closes, but I go to the golds at 6 AM when I slept for two hours. Like, why am I like that? Why am I not normal? Why, why can't I quit wrestling? If I quit wrestling, I'd either have to be a fucking stand up comic or, or a rock star. I don't know. Or a fucking X-Men. I don't know what else I could do. <laughs> like I, I, uh, and so I started seeing therapists and she told me something I thought was really interesting. They say people kind of are the way they are by genetics and environment. And I was like, my environment was good. I, I, my dad worked, we had food on the table, house overhead, loving parents. And then she told me environment is like from birth, it's like 23. And I was going, oh, like, yeah, my childhood was good. But from 16 on, I lived on the road. Like I was, I was with grown men doing crazy fucked up things that, like I said, and we were the tail end of the wild, wild west era. So imagine this was 1999 when I was on the road and the guys that I was on the road with were the wrestlers from the mid nineties and earlier. Yeah. So they were fucking lunatics. Yeah. Yeah. But even the attitude era guys were crazy, but I was with the crazier guys before then. And then when I got to the road on New York, I was so fucked up that I was hanging out with the attitude era guys that were left over, like the Bradshaws and the Jerichos and stuff. And uh, I wasn't hanging out with the guys that were my age. Um, I, I told this, I was hanging out with uh, Ken Kennedy, the other, or Ken Anderson, whatever the fuck his name is, the other day. And I was telling him a story. He didn't even remember it. That's how desensitized we are. He was the driver. The promoter was shotgun. I was sitting behind the driver. I was 16, I think, maybe 17 years old. And there's another wrestler next to me. And the promoter fucked him on his money. And he pulled out a buck knife out of his boot and opened the knife and reached over to the passenger seat and put the knife in the promoter's throat and held it up to him. And he said, I'm not moving this knife. So we go to ATM and you get the rest of the Who's this, Anderson? No, no, no. Anderson was driving. I'm sitting behind Anderson. You pulled the knife. No, no. The guy, the wrestler sitting next to me did. Okay. And you won't say who that is. I don't remember. Okay. An indie oh. guy. An indie guy. Okay. 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 And then um, I remember the promoter was a guy named Carmine uh, Despirito. And he pulled out a knife and he put it in Carmine's throat and he just said, I'm not moving this knife. So we go to an ATM and you get me the rest of my money. And I'm sitting in the back, 16 years old. I haven't even fucked yet. I haven't, I'm a virgin. <laughs> and, I'm like, and I'm sitting there and I'm going like this. I'm like, I'm with grown men. I can't cry. I just have to pretend this is normal. And I just yeah. sat there and no sold that guy. So we went to the ATM, got his money and like, I look back on it and I'm just going like, fuck that. I fuck me up. So yeah, that's not normal, bro. That, of course not. Of course. And I was just saying like, you know, I was, I would hang out in strip clubs when I was like, like my friends would like steal a case of beer from their dad's fridge on the weekends. And like wrestlers would take me into strip clubs. And like, you know, I kind of looked the same since I was 17 years old. So like girls didn't know any difference. I'm fucking girls are coming to my hotel room with fucking grand, like grand bags of cocaine and stuff. And like, I can't even buy cigarettes yet. You know, like, this kind of shit just happened like over and over again. And then I got to New York and I was making like tons of money. And like, I was, I was, I fucking main evented a pay-per-view against Hulk Hogan and Shawn Michaels on my 21st birthday. Jeez, like bro. most 21 year old kids are just getting wasted at some shithole VFW on their 21st birthday. That's crazy. I'm sold out. Uh, what's the building in, uh, in Boston? Uh, I can't remember. Anyways, the one in Boston sold out pay-per-view afterwards, like, literally have over a hundred thousand dollars in the bank fucking uh, fucking main event on cloud nine just crazy fucking kid don't know what to do and i'm trying to become more normal through failed relationships divorce bad is relationships. that working bro or are you are you finding yourself becoming more normal or once what once you know you're back at that arena does it kick in uh, it's it's hard because I am behaving normal, but it's like a conscious effort. I think it's what alcoholics do. They tell me that like alcoholics have to fight with themselves. Like I can't yeah. drink. I can't drink. Like I tell myself like I have to be normal. I have to be normal. Like I can't do. You know like I, I've <laughs> at the drop of a hat, I'll motherfuck somebody. I'll pull over yeah. and see them in the windshield. Like bro, so I, you got to keep going to therapy then, right, bro? I think so. I don't know. Maybe I have to get. I don't, I don't know. But I don't know. I don't know. And sometimes I fight with myself. I'm like, if I live in a circus, is it bad to behave as a circus animal? I don't know. I mean, if I go get a job at fucking McDonald's tomorrow, maybe I got to change my shit, but I don't plan on doing that. But it's really weird now because I don't fit in with anybody like I'm in the locker rooms. They're all my age too. I'm, I'm still like, like in their kind of ball. Some of them are younger than me, but like, you know, twenties to thirties is kind of where the guys are. But 
we are so fucking different. Yeah, well, you came from you came. Games. Yeah, you came from a different era, bro. You hung around different people. It's a different. It's a different business today. Oh, and Minneapolis was bad. We had all the fucking AWA fuck ups and stuff, and and it was it was bad. Now, now, Sean, somebody told me I was a little surprised by this, and yeah, I don't want you to talk about this if you don't want it because it's a I'm little an open bit. Book. I don't give a shit anymore. Well, it's a little bit about the private life. I was uh, somebody smart me up that you're not uh, with Alicia anymore. No, we broke up. Uh, I guess officially, like in April. You were you were together for a long time, though, huh, Five bro? Years, yeah. Was it amicable? Are you cool now with her? Or I hope it, it was exactly, amicable. It, it was. It was. It was. She is. I mean, you know, I don't know if you had any part of hiring her, but she is not from the wrestling business. You guys right. just needed a pretty girl, and you found a pretty girl, and then she sort of hung around the wrestling business because, really, she actually credits you a lot to it because you keep calling her back to work. She went to WCW, you called her up. You went to TNA, you called her up. Mm -hmm. But she never wanted to be in the wrestling business, cared to be in the wrestling business. She just get phone calls like, hey, come in. We'll give you a shit ton of money. She goes, okay. So that fucked with her a little bit. And then just my behavior, mostly. You know, like she didn't get why I was so fucking weird. Or, or you know, she doesn't, she doesn't get the circus animal aspect of it. Yeah. Because yeah. she's not one. She's a normal human being in the wrestling business. She goes, why can't you be a Well, you know, that, that leads me to an interesting question, Sean. Do you what, – what, when you, what, now you mentioned you, you're divorced, right, bro? Yeah, before did that, What was that? Before Alicia. Okay, but did that have a lot to do with it, bro, you being an animal in the environment? Yeah, absolutely. And it's not even my – it's, it's, when I say relationships, I mean relationships in my whole life with – Friends, girls, my parents, my brothers. It's all. It's well, bro, that that. that so so now now that leads me to a question: Are you? Do you think you need somebody in the wrestling business as a partner, or are you still looking for that normal person that may make you normal in the long run? Is that I've what you're always, looking for? Always, I've always, always, always looked. I have no interest in dating girls in the wrestling business, and Alicia was the perfect balance because she wasn't, but because she was around it, she got it. But again, she was normal more so than she got it. So she had a tipping point. Like I said, five years is a long time to deal with the case of the crazies before, before fucking she says, I can't do this anymore. You've fucking crashed five cars in two months and we have holes in our walls and shit like that. See, like, but now, Sean, sure, but you, you guys will, obviously, I'm assuming, along, you guys were living together, right? Yeah. So now you're living with your brother. Yeah. Bro, but doesn't that set you back 10 years? As far as personally? Yeah, no, as far as, you know, when you're mine and now my brother's a wrestler and now I'm kind of living that lifestyle a little. It's a big change because Alicia had kids too, right, bro? She had, she had one son. Yeah, because, bro, she, I'm, I'm telling you, she put over to me your relationship with her kid. That's why I remember she really put you over. But, bro, now you kind of went from a family environment back to my single wrestling brother. That had to, like, mess with your head a little bit, no? No, not really. I mean, one, I'm I'm trying to help him out. So like I, I can get him more money and I can get him more bookings when we do tags together. So that's kind of a lot to do with it. People fly me around, but they won't fly him around. So if we live together, we can drive to towns together, you. And, you know, save him gas money and stuff. Um, and and then um, the thing about Alicia is she, her son's dad is still, they have a 50, 50 custody. So half the time, I mean, he was, I never, never, ever misbehaved around him. He he was like my beacon of good moral value. So when he was around, I was I was a good guy. Mm -hmm. But we only had him fifty percent of the time. The other fifty percent of the time, we didn't have him, and that's when the fucking monster would come out. Sometimes think if shit was good, shit was good. But then also, I was on the road a lot. So when I was on the road, the monster would definitely come out, and that was really taxing on her to to you know, what are you doing? I'm at a strip club. F four hours later, what are you doing? I'm at a strip club. Then but bro, with, with with that experience with her son, did that make you wanna? I mean, start a family? It's, it's See, scary. Bro, you know, you're not ready. To, you're not ready to settle down yet, bro. No, nah, I don't know about ready to settle down. I'm not secure as a provider, uh, if in this line of work, because I made a lot of money with New York and I got nothing to show for it. I made good money at TNA and I got nothing to show for it. I make decent money right now and I really got nothing to show for it. And I just got to take care of myself. And at the time, Alicia and half of her, her son, half the time. But like, if I had kids, like, God, when I hear motherfuckers, like, 
oh, I can't buy my kids new shoes or because money's tight and stuff. God, I'd fucking hate to do that. Like, if my kid wanted new shoes, like, I'd have to get him new shoes. Like, You see, bro, but playing the role of therapist, you may be doing that mentally in your head to, to, to go to that place. You know what I'm saying? That may be a good excuse for you to not get married, not start a family, and not settle down. You see what I'm saying, bro? No, I mean, I've tried. I've done it all, and I'm, I'm not very good at it <laughs> for the most part. But, like, I uh, I also think that, like I said, it's just this job is so unstable. I've met very, very few people, maybe the top 2% that get out of the business and live comfortably. Everyone else, they're fucking lifers, and I feel like I'm a lifer. You know, bro, I just did an interview with uh, with a female uh, who was look, – she's looking for love in all the wrong places. I told her I may try to uh, set her up with with some of my uh, you know some of my acquaintances. Uh, would you be interested in me playing matchmaker if I tell you who this individual is? I have, yeah, sure. Let's, I'll, how about, I'll, I'll, I'll entertain you. How about Sean Devari and Miss ODB? No, you not, my God, you're the worst journalist ever. Do you not know me in ODB's history? I don't know it. No, we broke in together. My well, I, I figured that you're both from Minnesota, right? My first year of res wrestling, she was a huge chick, and I was a really tiny guy. My first like 25 matches were against Jess, and and that like we have like a big brother or little brother big sister relationship. Well, there, and, and there was there was no a, my best friend Ken Anderson. I know I, that that part I know. I know her and Anderson. Yeah, but so wait, hold on a minute. So you were brother sister gimmick, but there was never a romantic link. No, I mean it's. Could you fuck your sister? I couldn't. But bro, maybe that's it. Maybe it's supposed to be more than that, bro. I'm not that physically attracted to her. Ah, oh, bro. See, and, it's, it's, oh. and and here's no, but more than that, it's the brother sister thing. Like I I know I know her family. I know her like nephew and stuff. Like it's weird. And like I can't fuck my best friend's ex girlfriend. Bro, you're still in Minnesota, right? I am now. Okay, so yeah, yeah, and yeah. You guys were all from Minnesota, and so you that's how you you, you established a relationship with Anderson going back to Minnesota, right? Yeah, yeah, I brought him. I we lived together, he, yeah. he lived in Wisconsin, and there was fuck all going there. And I said, Come to Minneapolis, and and he started dating. I introduced him to Jess, and they started date Jess is ODB. Uh, they started dating, so yeah. they moved in together. We traveled everywhere together. Um, I got him his job in WWE. Uh, I tried to get him a job at TNA, and then eventually he did get one. It was after I was gone. Uh, yeah, we did. We do everything. I was just with his, him, and his kids at Chuck E. Cheese last night. Oh, yeah, I, I just spoke to him a week. I love him, man. He's one of the most realest guys I could speak to. I love talking to him, bro. Yeah, he, so he's now. That's nice about moving back to Minnesota. Oh, something I was trying to get to earlier about being like fucked up is like you feel normal around other carnies. But the problem is very rarely do carnies live in your town. So it's like, mm. I can't, I don't have friends to hang out with. Yeah. I have like yeah. normal people I know. And when we get out, I'm just like, either they bore me to death or yeah. they're scared to death of me. Yeah. Bro, you want to hear something funny about that? Troy? Listen, bro, I'm not one of the boys. I would never say I was one of the boys, but I was around that world long enough. Bro, I'm the same thing. Like, bro, my so many times my wife wants me to go out with people from work and this and that. And I'm like, I I lived in this freaking world for like 20. I what am I gonna have a conversation with with a normal person? Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like, bro, what the freak am I gonna talk about with the guy who who works for a computer company or the guy who's a dentist or I can't when you're in the wrestling business for 25 years, bro, you just you uh, there's something about it. you just can't be around normal people. I feel the same way. Why is that, bro? I don't know about you because you seem like a normal guy to me. Like I'm looking at your office right now and you look like a normal human being. That's the kind of shit. I mean, you have a crazy obsessive compulsive hoarding disorder, but like, like that looks, that looks like a normal guy's shit that he'd have in his office. Like I, I feel like you're relative. Even the fact that you said that, you know, at the ale house, you were fucking done with wrestling. Like you're, you moved on to, I'm going home. I'm going to see my kids, going to get my house, see my wife, all yeah. that shit. Like, I feel like you might feel a little weird, but you are, well adjusted and that's probably why you're able to hang around there and probably why you're very employable but it, i don't know I, th I think i think it's not even wrestlers i think it's show business people that are attracted you have to be fucking crazy to think that somebody's gonna pay money just to see me you know 
fucking narcissistic and crazy that That's thought a is. Good point, bro. Great point. Fucking, yeah. I, I meet people and they're just like, I can never get in a ring in front of thousands of people or millions of watching a TV. I'm like, really? I can never fucking work at IBM. Like, are you kidding yeah. me? Like, fuck, yeah. put me in the ring. Not even the ring. Put me on. The <laughs> I'll tell you a funny story. We were in Portland one time, and this is this is the part where I think I'm just fucked up. I don't think it's just wrestling. We were in Portland, and we went to a stand-up comedy show. It was like an open mic night for jabronis or whatever. And like this one guy is just bombing on stage, and I'm fucking I'm fucked. Like three sheets of the wind, fucked. And then he, I'm bored, and I'm just like hung, getting like I want to go to my hotel room, but I want to still party. And the guy's shit in the bed on stage. And I don't know what came over me. I get up on stage and I push the motherfucker off. He like takes an ass over tea kettle bump off the stage. And I get on the mic and I start burying the guy for like three minutes. No, no, that's an exaggeration. It was probably about a minute. Audience is laughing a little bit. They're more like shocked to see, checking if the guy's hurt and stuff. Well, that's another thing that, <laughs> another story. But uh, anyways, bouncer grabs me, pulls me off stage, takes me to the manager's office. I go, fuck, I'm going to jail or whatever. The manager opens up a book and he writes shit down. It was a fucking checkbook. He gave me a check for two hundred dollars and he said, "You saved my house tonight." That guy was the shit. Oh Not in those words, God. but he said that those people were leaving. They weren't going to buy another drink, and he cut me a check for two hundred. I saw it framed in my office in California. That is crazy. Was, so what I was saying about the fucked up thing about wrestlers, anyways, is uh, like I said, the guy took a bump off the stage. Half the audience wasn't even looking or paying attention to me. They were checking if the guy was okay. We were in uh, France one time and we we're trying to get into a nightclub, and there's a line backed out the door. And uh, in Paris, no, it was in Paris. Anyways, we're France. And um, it was like me, Charlie Haas, Shelton Benjamin, a couple other people. And um, down, like maybe half a block down the road, there's a guy and a girl in the street. And then the guy just fucking swats the girl and slaps the shit out of her. She takes a bump on the ground. And then the guy like tries to walk across the street. Well, apparently just like a hundred feet up, her friend was in her car. Like, I guess she was coming to pick the girl up. The girl sees the dude swatter. She punches the gas and runs the dude over. He rolls. It looked like a Hollywood stunt. Hits the hood, hits the windshield, rolls over the top, splatters on the fucking street. The whole fucking everyone outside waiting for the nightclub runs over to check if the guy's okay. All the wrestlers went in the front door. We partied all night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, bro. You guys are effed up, bro. There's, there's no doubt about it. You guys are effed up. Yeah, we I mean, we had a good crew in Houston. We used to call Houston like the mid cards Tampa. Like all the main adventures would live in Tampa, and the mid card would go to Houston. Yeah. So we all lived there, and we had fucking great. It was like, it was a bunch of hungry guys that really were we were doing great at work. We were all making money. We were all young, and we all lived together. So we'd party on the road. We'd go home. We'd party at home, and then like fucking one by one, we started dying. It's <laughs> just like uh -huh. it, it was like it wasn't like divorced, move away, sold the house. We started dying. And then, like, by the time, like, the third one died, like, then we're like, we got to pump yeah. the – and that lasted, like, two months, three months, and then uh, back to normal. And that's something – actually, it was funny. I, I was telling somebody the other day, I, I kind of shit on the guys a little bit for being – they're not dorks. They're, they're good. They're better people than, than I am. And uh, one thing I was like, I haven't done a 10-bell salute in a long time. I felt like I used to do them on a monthly basis. Mm, yeah. I've done more 10-bell – I, I done more 10 bell salutes and i've won belts yeah that's like, crazy bro. i haven't the last i haven't i can't remember the last one i did oh well, that's good though that's a good thing bro yeah and that's why i say like i shit on them because i'm bored after the shows but like it's it's a better thing like yeah. there's hopefully still some and i hate saying old timers because it makes me feel like i'm old timer but i know chronologically i'm not but like you know it was weird like when i was working for new york last you know on international tours that hang out with Undertaker and like Edge and stuff, but not domestically. Uh, and they called me back in 2012. They were looking at some former talents they wanted to bring in. And I went in and I did a dark match for them because uh, apparently they don't have footage or something. I don't know. They don't have the five years of footage I was there. They have to see me in person. Uh, and those guys like seeked me out. It was weird. Like Undertaker came up, started talking to me, Edge, Jericho, you know. And I was just, I kind of came close. I'm like, these guys are lonely. Oh, like, yeah. They no, get bro. They don't, they have no, bro, you, like the guys that were the upper echelon that didn't yeah. really deal with me, except for when we were stuck on the road for 20 days. Yeah. Like, they were just like somebody to talk to. Oh, I've been so bored. Bro, I felt the same way, man. I just did a show over the weekend and like, bro, I saw, uh, I saw Ron Simmons and I saw Dreamer and I'm like, oh my God, I felt the same way because you just feel like that's, 
just that era is just really dying a slow death, bro. I mean, I agree with you a hundred percent, you know? And it's a good thing. Like I, I don't like, I, I shouldn't say I don't like it. It's a good thing. You know, I want like a lot of my friends that are working now for like New York, like, I don't, I want them to work there for a long time. Like usually, even if they didn't die, drugs, alcohol, and bad decisions cost them their jobs, cost yeah. them their families. Yeah. yeah. Like, it's, it's, it's better now. Yeah. Guys are getting married and staying married. There's no more rats anymore. They yeah. stop the search. So you no know, bro, I'm, I'm tough on the business. I'm tough on the business just from a creative aspect. But what you're just saying there, you're dead on, bro. You know, it probably is a much healthier environment and you know that's 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 good all around for the boys i agree with you know that. what it is i think i and I, I don't know who's to give credit to it for i think it's hunter because i think hunter was one of the boys for so long and now that he's in a position of power he could say like hey here's all the fucking areas where you guys really didn't take care of me that you know like vincent yeah. never dealt with or yeah. jr never dealt with i think when you have for the first time ever a talent in a executive position where you go, here's all the places where I wish you guys would have helped me out and you didn't. Yeah. He can make those like my, like I said, my little brother just did that cruiserweight thing. And he said the NXT facility is amazing. When you're green and you're brand new, they put fucking headgear on you to learn to take bumps. Yeah. That's fucking genius. That's yeah. fucking genius. They have one ring that the whole surface is made of crash pad foaming. So if you're green or new or inexperienced, you could try on the crash pad instead of trying on a hard ass ring. Yeah. I used to have to go to OVW with like Matt Morgan and Nathan Jones and they beat the, they were so fuck. I mean, Matt actually wasn't that bad, but Nathan Jones was a shit. And he fucking killed me every and like, oh, you're small, fucking get in with Nathan. You know, and they, oh, I want to try this fucking thing where I, I backdrop you off the top rope. And I'm like, okay. Oh, I didn't get it the first 10 times. The 11th mm. time will be the lucky one. You know, yeah. shit like that. Or even yeah. I remember guys like, um, uh, when Bobby Lashley came in, he'd never been in a ring before and he was just taking bump after bump and not getting it. And it wasn't explained to him. Well, I felt I'm going, this guy's going to fucking be punchy before he even gets on the yeah, road. But yeah, I, I looked at him. I said, this guy yeah. is a main event guy. Why the fuck are we killing him with a million bumps? Like, let's get to that later. Like he'll get it eventually. Yeah. Well, that's good. Yeah. That, that definitely is an improvement in the right direction. So Sean, we're cool now. Are we cool now, bro? No, fuck no. Your office. Oh, <laughs> no, no, of course. I don't want to have, he, like I said, you, Scott Hall, we're going to, you know, unbury test and I'm going to patch it up with him. But like, I don't, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to have heat with him. I'm fucking old. I'm grizzled. I'm nasty. I'm a fucking. Bro, you're 32 years old. L listen to you, bro. Old and grizzled at 32. Come on. So here's, here's the thing I was talking to about, um, uh, what was I talking? I was talking to a big motherfucker. Oh, do you know a guy named Gene Snitsky? I think so. Yeah, sounds big guy, very familiar. Freakish looking dude, like almost seven feet tall. And we yeah. were like, talking about like bumps and concussions and stuff. And I was like, dude, you've never been five foot eight and under 200 pounds. You have no idea how many bumps I had to take and how many big bumps I had to take compared to how many you did. Our, our careers could have been the same length. His could, might, could be even longer, but he didn't take as much abuse mm -hmm. as I did not because I worked harder, not because he didn't work as hard, but like I was fucking new big green guy at camp, like that Nathan Jones scenario, the biggest guy there. I want to work on choke slams today. Okay, you're a million dollar investment. We're gonna work on choke slams. Yeah. Who's the lightest guy? Hey, Sean, fucking hundred choke slams. You know, yeah. and that was yeah. shitty training. They got apparently they have better trainers now that don't do that. Yeah. But even shit like you know, I, I remember I was telling some, we were talking about chair shots to the head, and I said like. I would rather take a chair shot to the head 10 times over than fucking take a big bump. Like those big bumps fucking kill me. The chair yeah. I get, or even, even like when people like say like, are you punchy from like potatoes and stuff? I'm like, fuck no. I, I want someone to punch me as hard as they can. The fucking on the canvas, on the canvas, on the canvas. That's the shit that's killed me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, bro, listen, Sean, I'm glad you came out here. Like I said, I was thrilled to death you got the email. I'm glad you came out. Bro, I could tell by just what you're saying. There's a million other things to talk about. And now that we've got this out, I definitely would love to bring you on again so we could talk about those things. You sound like you have freaking stories and tales that are as entertaining as hell. 
I'd love to hear every one of them. You're I want to be my ghostwriter. I'm gonna get a book with the old ECW Press. You can write it for me. Well, I don't know about it, bro. I don't know about ECW Press with the payday, but that's another story for another give me, time. Give me a strong book advance. You can be my ghostwriter. Okay. Well, bro, we'll talk about that. But bro, listen. Where can we now? You're working independently. Yep. Where can we follow you? Give me all your social media and all that stuff. Yes, I, I don't do the. I I don't talk to marks online. I shouldn't say that. I don't talk to fans online. Uh, just seandavari.com, S-H-A-W-N-D-A-I-V-A-R-I.com. I have an email on there. I don't answer fan mail. I don't do the social media gimmick. I, if you want to see me or talk to me, buy a ticket. <laughs> like, But they can book you. Promoters can book yeah, you through I that address. I have an email on there. It says, it says, for booking inquiries only, in big capital letters. Got you. Well, Sean, bro, I'm like I said, man, you, I have so much respect for you for the email. You made my, it was very late at night when I got that. You made my night. Uh, this interview, I'm um, I'm just so happy that it took place. Because as I said, bro, I always liked you. That's what bothered me more than anything. But Sean, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say uh, 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 goodbye now to the audience. But I want you to hang on because I just want to say a personal thank you. But thanks for joining us here today. Yeah, bro. I gotta tell you a story. I can't tell on air. Tell me. What's Okay, well, uh, yeah, you see, everybody, maybe I'll tell you that story. Maybe I won't. Probably not. It's right about time again to swerve again. Confuse the general fans again. Add another swerve and then put it on a pole again. Put it on a pole again. Put it on the pole again. And I swear to God, it's gonna get emotional. I wait to overbook the damn cards.